questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Well, you heard a bit of my bio. Don't believe any of it. Um, I'm talking out of my bio zone, but not necessarily out of my comfort zone. And I'm also wearing a white coat so I can look smarter than I really am. Uh, good morning to everybody on OTN. Um, Kelly Milne asked me to fill the gap because today's scheduled speaker couldn't come. So I was trying to figure out, okay, what's, what's practical? What's a big problem that faces all of us clinicians looking after all older adults? And this is it, right? Should be. Every, everybody has this problem, regardless of whether you're an inpatient service, community, long-term care, retirement home. Okay, I have no conflict of interest to declare no shares in Metamucil or in Peglax. And this is what I'd like you to understand at the end of the presentation. Pharmacology of some of the common treatments given to manage constipation. And I want you to get a sense of what would be a systematic approach to manage this problem going forward. And if I make any mistakes with pharmacology, I have Derek up there to correct me. Okay, let's start. It's Friday morning. You didn't really want to come and hear about bowel pathology. Uh, but here it is. You have to know a little bit about it because everything, well, to put it into context, when I was growing up, there was this book, it, it was pretty thick and it, call, it was called The Way Things Work. I don't know whether any of you remember that. It was like three inches thick and it described all sorts of machines and things and why and how they worked. Well, when we get to understand what constipation is and you understand how things work, then you'll have an easier time of managing this problem. Okay, I'm going to focus only on the large bowel here, which is involved in constipation. And you can see that the large bowel, let me get the pointer so everybody can follow along on the OTN sites. There's three things, well, two major ones, absorption and secretion, and then this last one, digestion. And if you look at that, the, the large bowel absorption, three liters of fluid or water capacity per day, that's a lot of fluid being absorbed by the bowel or the, the colon. It also secretes, so 32 milliequivalents uh, potassium uh, is secreted by the bowel per day. So here at the bottom I've illustrated, there's 12 standard glasses of uh, 250 mil glasses of water. Some, oh, okay, that's the hospital. And, and here are the eight standard bananas re, uh, representing the 32 mil equivalents of potassium that's uh, secreted. Also on the large bowel, you know that there is a gut bacteria which helps with cellulose digestion because we can't digest it, so that's what the gut bacteria do. So those are the functions of the large bowel. It also has a capacity, it can store, and it has a motility function. It has to propel things along it to make all this happen. So just some facts so that at the next uh, cocktail party you're at, you can say, well, did you know that this is the capacity of the large bowel? So it's 160 centimeters in length, so 5.2 feet, a little shorter than I am. Um, that's its diameter and times pi, you remember your high school mathematics, and you end up with a capacity of 3.3 uh, liters. Now imagine if this thing was completely full of stuff. That'll end up weighing 3.3 kilos or 7.2 pounds. So if you have any of your older patients who've had a miraculous moment and have a huge bowel movement, don't be surprised they've lost weight. So descending colon, that's the part that really gets gummed up quite often. Its capacity is about one liter, 1,000 cc's, and the average stool is 400 grams per day in, in normal people. So now you've got a sense of the volumes and what's happening there. Motility. The small bowel, the small intestine transit time is anywhere between an hour and a half and two hours. And then a large intestine, by the time you get to the uh, ascending colon all the way across and to the outside, is 30 to 40 hours. So it's pretty slow. And here, motility, the natural rhythm, you've got two to 13 
peristaltic waves per minute coming across the bowel. Um, so that's the natural. So I think with our older adults, it'll be on the slower side. And with our younger adults, maybe on the faster side. So that's the usual. Now, if things go wrong, you've got enhanced contractility, which doesn't happen much to our older population. But here you might have dysfunctional movements. So colonic paresis are really slow, so less than two waves per minute. Inertia, you've got spasms, so things, you'll have a, a contraction that doesn't propulse, you know, it doesn't create a wave all the way down. Or you may have contractions that go the wrong way. So all these things can contribute to poor bowel transit time. Okay, I hope this shows up. This is, this is neat. Just while you're um, chewing on your morning snack, right? Come on, let's play this. Come on. Oh, quick time not available. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, because it would have, the little uh, video would have shown uh, a close-up of these peristaltic waves, you know. It's like a, a uh, can of worms. Pretty disgusting, but that's what it looks like. And, it, and, it, and it's meant to show that the, the bowel is a very dynamic organ. Okay, so that's not going to show. Physicians lament. Well, I should actually um, change this to clinicians lament. Anybody who's in clinical care and with bowel hygiene and constipation specifically, we always get interrupted and flagged and say, Please do something now. They haven't had a bowel movement in blank days. Of course, we want to fix things in medicine. So then we try what we know. Um, unfortunately, one size doesn't fit all, which is what I, I'm going to try and uh, point out to you as we go along. And us physicians have minimal training in pharmacology. so. Here we are prescribing and throwing all these things at constipated older people, and we don't really know what we're doing. So please don't ask us too many times, because we may not know exactly what we're doing and prescribing for these people. And lastly, bowel functioning is a low priority item. So yes, they're short of breath, they've got chest pain, they've got a painful knee, they've got pain somewhere and distressing something, but do we really pay a lot of attention to the last time they had a bowel movement, their consistency and their comfort and all that stuff? To the medical system, this is a low priority, but it's a high comfort item and a high quality of life item, so maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to it. Okay, talking about constipation, we have to define it, right? Because what is constipation to one person may be different to another in, in their thinking and their mind. Uh, here are some of the terms that have been thrown out. Difficulty in emptying bowels, hardened feces, evacuations difficult and frequent, sensation of incomplete evacuation. This one's probably the closest to um, the all-encompassing definition. Fewer than three bowel movements a week or hard, dry and small bowel movements that are painful or difficult to pass. So it doesn't mean I don't have a bowel movement per day as constipation. A change may be, uh, for, for a person who does have a bowel movement per day and goes down to three times a week, that may be constipation for them. Someone who has three bowel movements a week going down to once a week, that would be constipation for them. So it's a, you have to use the individual and their usual bowel habits to um, create your definition there. Let's go to cases, and then we'll see how we can manage these. First one is a 90-year-old woman. Um, I'm going to show images. These are going to be x-rays and CT scans, because I don't want to show the patient. It won't give you much information. Um, so here we have a sort of a plain x-ray of the abdomen. There's a pelvis there. This person has had a previous hip surgery. And you see all this sort of grayish material. So this person is badly constipated or full of stool. Now when you do a CT scan, and here's a cut uh, probably just below the, the head of the, the hip there, 
And this is the colon or the rectosigmoid with stool. And I threw some measuring lines up. So it's 7.3 by 6.4 centimeters. So you can get a sense of, of the size of this thing. And this is like a different view of that same person. Um, so if I go back, this was a cross-sectional, and this is like a slice, a sagittal section. So you've got a, a, a sense that this thing's the size of a uh, squash, or a large gourd, or medium-sized gourd. And there's another view, the coronal section. So it's pretty significant, right? Show you another one. This one's an 88-year-old man. And uh, different images again. This is the, the uh, coronal section. It's, it's um, a boomerang-shaped collection. There is uh, in the sagittal section. So those two cases, there they are. They've got a fecaloma in the bottom. Right? So how do we start managing? So this is the practical stuff coming up. Bottom-up approach. Um, so case one, if you calculate, uh, that's the volume, 250 to 300 cc's. And case two, 350 to 400 cc's. So I think the first thing in constipation is to, you need to do a rectal exam. Um, some of my images, oh, there's the image. Rectal exam. <laughs> Try and find the person who has the longest index finger. <laughs> That will help you a lot, uh, and and it will um, at least detect the presence of the impaction. Impaction is probably uh, safest, etc. But it's not always done well, so you have to move on to other things. So you want to unplug the bottom, and this is where um, I like to put my uh, public service message out. Please never consider soap suds enemas. Because I really don't know what a soap suds enema is made of. Like, what kind of soap do you use? Do you use Dove? Do you use Ivory? Do you use Tide? Uh, how much water do you put in it? Um, so there's nothing standardized about it. And when you don't use standardized therapy, you don't know what kind of effects or side effects you're going to get. And in fact, um, some surgeons many, many years ago in the 60s have shown that by giving people soap suds enemas to clear a constipation, you actually cause colitis. So that's not very good. So you, you can cause a chemical colitis. The other thing is uh, fleet enemas. Wonderful invention, but they're a no-no in older people because uh, anybody over the age of 80, I would presume, has some degree of <coughs> renal impairment. And uh, fleet enemas have a lot of sodium and phosphate and cause lots of fluid shifts. So they're not good for older patients. So what's our solution? It comes from uh, Ottawa Public Works. It's water. Just open the tap, uh, lukewarm, one liter, buy an enema bag. It's sort of like gargling. <laughs> Don't want to keep that image in your mouth, but anyways. So tap water enema, very effective, can be repeated very often. I mean, you can give a tap water enema every half an hour if you want to. Uh, to be effective, one liter infused, uh, lie them on their left lateral side so that the uh, fluid is in the descending colon. And because of the rectocolic reflex, because you've stuck something in the rectum, the stretch of the colon, uh, all that stuff, um, they're going to get this peristaltic wave in about 20 minutes or so and sit them up and then hopefully they'll evacuate and they'll feel better for it. So uh, tap water enemas are effective, cheap and safe. Okay, so now we're going to start running into all the pharmacotherapy agents and try and describe to you what they are, whether they're effective, and uh, put it into um, um, sort of a pathway. The red pill. How many have not seen this? How many of you have not seen Colace? Okay. Here it is, down here. 
It is soap. So um, the marketing people are really good, right? In a gel cap, they can they put soap and market it as a pill for uh, constipation. It doesn't work because it's a yes, it's a stool softener. What it does is emulsifies fat in the gut. So the person actually has to have fat in the gut. Now, how many of the old people have a lot of fat in their gut in their diet? Well, that's problem number one. Problem number two is. If they have a motility issue, like I mentioned the capacity of the bowel and the motility, if they have a motility issue, you've got fat in the gut, you've got colase going on, you've increased the bulk, you've made it softer, but it's not going anywhere. So you've got soft constipation. So that's not gonna help too much. Right? So colase in older individuals, ineffective. We should really take it off the formulary except for specific areas like uh, post-rectal, uh, anorectal surgery and uh, postpartum. Okay, so here's sort of a, a um, grouping of agents that we use for managing constipation, uh, moving contents along. So there's osmotic agents which cause the transfer of salt and water into the colon. Remember I said there's three liters that that are absorbed. Well, if you absorb less or transfer back some of that three years, you can have a lot of watery stuff in your bowels. Um, and then the cost involved. So magnesium salts, they're cheap. Lactulose is a little more expensive. And PEG, PEGLAX, that's the most expensive of those. You have a class of the motility agents, Bisacadil, Cascara, Senecot, Domperidone, Percalipride, and you see the increasing cost. And then special agents, and I'm gonna go through these and illustrate and, and you'll see examples of uh, what they're about. And then these special agents are really expensive out in the bottom here. So osmotic agents, so magnesium salts, there's magnesium hydroxide off the shelf. This is going to pull salt and water the moment it hits your GI tract. So pass the lips into the stomach, boom, it started. So um, if you take uh, 30 cc's of this, by the time it comes out the other end, you've probably got 300 cc's. So it's pretty effective. Like It's a really good osmotic effect. Now, this guy up here. I don't know where the popularity of this came from, but I think it's a, been a very successful marketing thing. Um, so here's the molecule, and when you look at the molecule uh, officially, I would classify it as plastic. Just think about that. Powdered plastic. It's actually a plastic that actually dissolves in water. Good. It's not melamine, right? So, but it is plastic as a compound. So it's very inert. Like think of ground up Lego blocks, right? Uh, with some salt. Now, the thing that people don't understand about PEG or PEGLAX or Go Lightly, uh, you mix it in water, 250, 300 cc's. Got to be ice cold because it doesn't taste that good. But it has to be taken as a bolus to really be effective. What do our older patients do? They take a little straw and they sip it, right? They sip it in little boluses of 15, 10 cc's. Well, that's fine if it gets into the stomach, but you really want to get that peg lax through the stomach as one big bolus as much as possible. Because in fact, the, the 250 cc's you mix it in, out the other end comes about 260 cc's. It doesn't drag as much water into the bowel. So it acts like a, a plunger through your bowel. So it's more effective as a bolus. So that's, that's the downfall of Peglax, that it may not be effective unless taken as a bolus. Okay, here we go. The next uh, most popular, lactulose. Well, it's a disaccharide, fructose plus galactose. Uh, here it is. That's what it really looks like. So now you, you're getting the science part of this, right? So got all these molecules for you to understand. How does it work? Well, the gut bacteria are the only um, things that can uh, metabolize this because we can't. 
because of, um, I think this guy here, can't remember which part. Um, and it gets, this, this disaccharide gets metabolized to lactic plus acetic acid, acidifies the bowel lumen and it pulls salt and water because of the osmotic forces. Uh, it's also very good because it does this um, to treat uh, hepatic encephalopathy and trapping ammonia into the gut, etc. But now that you understand this sugary, sweet, syrupy thing um, only works when it gets to the gut, into the large intestine, it has to get there. So the um, 30 cc's of lactulose that you give to your patient by mouth, like I said, the bowel transit time is about 90 to 120 minutes, the small bowel. Don't expect anything for at least two hours. If you do, it's something else that's doing it, right? So it, it takes time. It's not an immediate. If you're going to use lactulose as an osmotic cathartic and you want immediate results, you have to give it as an enema because that's where you can feed the gut bacteria directly. But by mouth, you're not going to get instantaneous results. Okay, so now we're going to move to the motility agents and how they work and why we use them. Here we go. The first one, Dulcolax or Bisacadil. Um, this comes as uh, oral tablets and also suppositories. <coughs> There's the compound up there. It has to be uh, actually um, metabolized by gut bacteria and into, the, into these diphenols and then it acts on the uh, muscular wall to increase peristaltic waves. So it's a prokinetic or motility agent, but again, it has to work its way through and get metabolized. So again, it's not an immediate acting compound. Cascara. This is, uh, in the old days, we used to have what's called the black and white cocktail for, for um, constipation. White, co white part was milk of magnesia, and the black part was cascara. <laughs> so this is the plant, the berries. So if you're going picking, berry picking in the woods, don't take too many of these. Well, you're in the woods, it's OK. So um, just, just beware, right? So again, Cascara contains uh, alkaloids that are uh, prokinetic, increasing bowel motility, and uh, you know you increase your peristal peristaltic waves from two per minute to ten per minute, then you're going to find things will move along. Senna, related to cascara, comes from this guy here, the senna plant. So they were very creative naming this compound, senna alkaloids, senna, senna. Um, X-lax is, is actually senna in it. Um, whoops, back up. So again, plant-derived alkaloid, same effect, increasing peristaltic waves, increasing motility. This is the new kid on the block, procalipride. Here's the chemical. Um, interesting drug. It's, uh, it was designed, developed out of the uh, misadventure of cisapride, which was taken off the market because of QT prolongation and cardiac deaths caused by it. So they went back to the drawing board and they developed this molecule and said, okay, we've got to make it safer but have the same effect. So this thing is not metabolized. It's excreted almost unchanged in the urine. Um, it's a 5-HT receptor agonist with prokinetic properties. So it will increase your peristaltic waves. It has no effects on the cardiac conduction. And of course, these magical drugs are not covered by Ontario drug benefits. Um, cost per month is about $40, I think. Um, so when you discuss with patients, that may have to pay for this and they have chronic constipation, you, you sit them down and you say, okay, what are you spending per month on other things to help manage your bowels? And oftentimes it's like $100 a month anyways. So this one pill a day at $40 a month may be the answer and it may cost less for that person. 
This is actually one of the first medications that has um, fairly strong evidence that's effective and the studies that have been published says it works in little old ladies who have chronic constipation. Um, why they don't have evidence in little old men, I don't know. They have extended the study to look at little old men, but that data hasn't come out yet. And uh, we're still waiting. In fact, eight years ago they started that. Maybe little old men are much more constipated. It takes a long time to figure this out. So, lastly, we have this um, group called the Special Agents. And these are your special weapons special agents because they're more expensive. And this is when all else has failed and you're uh, at the end of your rope. Here's one of the first ones, and they're all recent or new medications, designer drugs, right? Linaclotide. Um, this, it's a capsule, it's once a day, binds to intestinal guanolate cyclase 2C receptors, as if I know where those are. Uh, and, but regardless of where those are and what they do, this is what it does, increases peristaltic contractions. So it works like cascara and Santa and all that stuff, but it binds to a different area. So you might get an additive effect if you're going to use both. And I, I memorize that for next week, and then you'll know exactly what we're doing, right? No, I have no idea what that is, but that's the molecule. Um, so that again has been, uh, there is evidence in a double blind trial to say this works. Uh, again, it's not covered by Ontario Drug Benefits. It's about $45, $50 a month for the 30-day supply. Next new one, Lubipristone. Um, comes in two strengths because it's actually been studied for chronic constipation and irritable bowel syndrome, the one that goes between constipation and diarrhea. So it works in both. Interesting, this, well, let me bring it up. That's what the molecule looks like. Activates chloride channels in the gut, increasing secretions and motility. You look at that and you say, hmm, that's what cholera toxin does, sort of. So, okay, well, we've got a designer cholera toxin. So it doesn't make you sick, but at least it'll increase the secretion. So interesting concept to uh, sort of copy what nature already has created for us, but in a controlled way so that we can um, pick and choose what we want the effects of. So again, this is new. Uh, it is, I think it's covered under an LU code. Yeah. No? Uh, anyways, don't know. Uh, again, unlikely going to be covered in, in uh, general usage, but a new drug with a slightly different mechanism of action. And then lastly, this ultra specialized designer drug, methylnaltrexone. And there's a molecule. As you see, it's an injectable. It's only given by subcutaneous injection once a day maximum, usually once every two days or three times a week. And what it does is it binds to the gut mu opioid receptor. This is a drug that's specifically targeted to opioid-associated constipation. So someone's got chronic opioid use because of non-cancer pain or cancer pain, palliative care, etc. Most of these patients are on over 100 milligrams equivalent per day of morphine and they're severely constipated and you've tried everything and it, nothing works. So along comes this super molecule, the injection happens, it kicks off the opioid off the gut receptors only because it, it doesn't have any effect on the brain receptors because it can't cross into the brain. Um, and lo and behold, the gut wakes up and you have a magical moment. So this is very, very helpful for those people who are, have opioid-associated constipation. Again, as a last-ditch effort, um, they're all expensive. And one vial is $70. 70, and that's not... That doesn't come with the nurse and the needle, right? So somebody has to put it into a needle and inject it. Um, but if it works, it works. You improve the quality of life of uh, your patient there.
So I'm going to put it all together and then I will open up to questions. Uh, how do you deal with the constipation? Well, unblock the exit. So like I mentioned, digital rectal examination, clear out the fecaloma, tap water enemas, very, very effective, can be repeated and it's safe. Use agents that have different mechanisms of actions at different places. So if you're going to use, if you look at the combination of Senna and lactulose, Senna is a pro-motility agent and lactulose is an osmotic agent. So you can get additive effects from those two separate agents. Does not make sense to use milk of magnesia or magnesium salt and lactulose. They're both osmotics. Does not make sense to add PEG to lactulose. They're both osmotics. So use a motility and an osmotic agent and you'll get perhaps a better effect because of the different mechanisms of action. The specialized ones, even the motility, amongst the motility, if you mixed Senna cot and Pricalopride, you might get an additive effect. But you're still within that same class of medication. So if you can pick different agents across the different categories and how they work, then you might get better success. And again, once flow is established, if you've emptied the colon, and here's where it goes back to that capacity thing. We have three liters in the colon. So if each bowel movement is four to 500 cc's, you need six really good bowel movements before you've emptied the colon out if this has been going on for a long time. So after that first big bowel movement, you can't raise the flag and say, hooray, you've got to wait for six. Then you can move to stage two, which is keeping things moving. Soluble fiber and fluids, gravity and physical activity. I think physical activity being up and moving as much as possible, I mean, I'm preaching to the converted because we're in geriatric care here. So uh, that's, that's sort of a given. And so just a comment on soluble fibers and fluid. Uh, this is a psyllium plant. Uh, again, we have a um, good marketing scheme here. You know, why is psyllium been the winner of the soluble fiber uh, contest? Well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I guess somebody decided this is the winner. But here's stuff that we, that we eat that can contain psyllium and or soluble fiber. It's not the only source. Um, you have to be careful that some of these things, the fruits and vegetables that we in ingest, have a combination of both soluble fiber and insoluble or cellulose. So the cellulose component, being insoluble, like I said at the beginning, will be digested by the gut bacteria, can load, uh, lead to cramping, bloating, gas. Right? So the cellulose, as it gets digested, can um, produce gas. So that's where some people become uh, fruit and veggie uh, Averse because uh, they don't like the cramping and bloating and gas. But the soluble fiber doesn't do the same thing. So there's that, that education to the patient, the family, and all of us just to try and target things better. And again, moving helps. Um, so I included a bunch of references, so I'll make this uh, a little bit more evidence informed. And um, this is what we have to do. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for a great review of uh, the treatment.